Hello, welcome, greetings. Everybody here for uh, Denver Liberty on the Rocks? Yeah. Or commies slipped in, I hope? Or maybe I hope they did come so they can learn a few things. Uh, welcome everybody, we are Denver Liberty on the Rocks. We are a social drinking club and we talk about libertarian ideas uh, and all that that entails. So tonight we are going to be doing uh, a group discussion. Yeah, the volume on me a little bit. I'm gonna turn me up. Can you hear me better? Can you hear me back there? Cool. So we're gonna do a group discussion tonight. We're gonna talk about pragmat <coughs> pragmatism versus idealism. And anyone who wants to can come up here and talk. Uh, you can jump on the mic. You can you can re rebut. Uh, try to keep it relatively short. We're thinking about two minutes. And Justin is gonna kind of lead that debate going tonight. Uh, he's gonna frame it and all that. Uh, but before we get to that, we are going to do our 30 second soapbox. And I also want to mention that we are finally going to start getting some stuff ready for easier contributions, setting up a Patreon account as well as getting all of our cryptocurrency addresses up and running. So if you guys have anything that you would like to contribute in, let us know and we'll set up a wallet for it somewhere. Um, if you have any other platforms you'd like us to get behind, um, since you know Patreon has gotten a lot of heat lately for uh, censoring people, you know, that's probably not where we want to accept all of our donations. So if anyone has any of that, just reach out to the Facebook page. You can contact me, Justin, Kiara, um, and we'll try and get that set up. Sorry to contradict you. Don't contact them. Contact me, Kiara, K-I-A-R-A, at libertyontherocks.org, and I'll actually get back to you. <laughs> it's my life, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it's my life. So, know your um, role. I'm, I'm still learning. So we're going to start a 30 second soapbox. Anyone who wants to come up and talk about any cause, any idea, uh, maybe you're, you got a D and D group and you're you some sweet roles. You want to tell people about your dungeon master? You can come up and talk about that. You know, we won't judge you too harshly. So, does anybody have anything they want to talk about tonight? Pat? Pat's got a D and D group. <laughs> Hi, my name is Pat Wagner, and um, in my real life, I'm a management consultant. I do all that kind of stuff for businesses and nonprofits that everything from personnel management, leadership, strategic planning. And I know a lot of entrepreneurs don't think they know, need anybody, but it's kind of like trying to build a house without a contractor and an architect. And someday you realize you don't have the foundation. And my specialty is conflict management. And I'm very comfortable standing in front of a group of screaming smart people who aren't listening to each other and getting them to listen to each other. And I don't charge for email or phone consultation. Come see me. Thank you. Your contact info? Pat, what was your contact info? Um, I have business cards, Pat at patternresearch.com. Our company's called Pattern, P-A-T-T-E-R-N Research. Some of you know my husband, Leif. Raise your hand, sweetheart. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's not, it's not just me, Leif. <laughs> <laughs> Justin? Um, you, we may need you to mediate later if it becomes a bloodbath in here between the two, the two sides. Uh, I, I want everybody to check out, hey, I'm Justin. I want you to check out the podcast I just started with my superior half, uh, Meg. We uh, started the Longo Convo podcast, and we talk about almost, we haven't talked about politics or policy or libertarianism yet. We're, gonna, we're just talking about all things. So this isn't a political thing. This isn't a health thing or a, a money thing. This is an everything podcast. Um, what? What, JD? What else is we there? haven't talked about France yet. I'm sorry, JD. <laughs> Have, uh, but so have you had a drink Congo. today? Com. What? Have you had a drink today? I have not had a drink today. All right. I will not have a drink for another 31 days. Um, check out logoconvo.com. We're on SoundCloud. We're going to get on all the other stuff, so check that out. And tell, me, tell us what you think. Anybody else? My man in the back here. What's your name? Hi, I'm Mike with the Libertarian Party, and we're having a convention again this year, April 26th. Um, you don't go there to vote or anything. You go there to see all the cool keynote speakers and, that we have and also meet other activists and libertarians in Colorado. So April 26th. Thanks, Mike. Kiara. Hi, honey. Can't, you can't tell me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> Give me the mic. I didn't even have to do more than stare at him. 
Um, I just wanted to let you guys know there are some USB devices in the back. Um, what those are is something that you plug into your computer. They mine a little bit of cryptocurrency. That cryptocurrency gets sent to an address um, where it's used by a group who's going to use it to bail people out of jail in New York State. Um, don't plug anything into your computer without researching it first, but take one of those, do a little bit of research on bail block, and if you like what they're doing, plug it in. Crypto, free in the world. You guys want to get a thousand of those and plug them into every computer at the place that you work? <laughs> you that, right, that could help them out. They should probably not do that. That's how I got fired. Anyone else? Sloan? Hey guys, my name is Sloan Devins, and I just graduated from my master's program in mental health counseling. So if you or anybody you know is looking for mental health services, I'm launching into my own private practice, and um, I'm part of a group that's doing neurofeedback. So if you want to know more, just let me know. You can contact me at sloan.devins at yahoo.com. Or in person. Can I submit my older sister? Is that, is that how it works? Can I commit her? I got, I got more than one sister. It's a lot of business. <laughs> Figure out how I can do it. Okay, anyone else? Oh, and I, I did forget to mention all the material in the back is free. Please grab it, take it. Uh, take two, three, four things, however much you want. Okay, so we're going to get started. Uh, so we're going to get started with our debate slash conversation. It's going to be fairly friendly. I'm going to let Justin come up here and uh, go ahead and frame that for us. All right. Let's give it up for the founder of Liberty on the Rocks. Got to make a big deal every time. Justin Longer. All right, so if you've been in this Liberty world for any period of time, you've seen and felt the tension between the pragmatists and the idealists. And so one side is going to take whatever incremental gains that they can get for... They're going to wheel and deal to get any incremental gains they can get. These people we call pragmatists. Any, any incremental gains that could be, for example, uh, at the Independence Institute, we have a, an organization that works within us called Coloradans for Civil Liberties, and their tagline is getting our freedoms back one round at a time. So they, you would, we would consider them pragmatists because they are willing to lobby and do whatever they can to get one round back on their magazine at a time. They're not going to say, give me all five back at one time or else I'm not going to take anything. So an ideologue, on the other hand, would say, I refuse to give up or give in at all until I get exactly what I want. So if there's a better definition for these two sides, please uh, let, let us know. But I think that's, we all, we've all, have we all felt this tension between like the pragmatists and the ideologues, right? So. I don't think it's an all or nothing proposition. I don't think any person is really 100% in either direction. It's kind of hard to exist in reality if your head is always in the clouds and vice versa. If, if you don't have, if you don't have a, a North Star or, or any sort of direction that you're going towards, if you're a pragmatist with no, no, no plan or no goal, then you, you sort of have to have the, the idealism in you to know where you're going. So I think both sides need each other and there's Everyone is sort of like a little bit of both. But in this room, I've seen a lot of people get, get intolerant of the other side for whatever reason. So for example, this last, uh, one of the last, uh, the last one we had in, in December, there was a person speaking about the medical marijuana, mer medical marijuana industry in Colorado and talking about the restrictions on, on medical marijuana growers and users and things like that. And of course, a, libertar a libertarian in the back had to raise their hand and say, why are you dealing with the regulations at all? Why don't you just do whatever the hell you want to do? And to which the medical marijuana advocate said, my patients are getting their doors kicked down. You can, you know, you can have whatever pie in the sky utopia you can dream about, but the fact is, in this reality in which we live, people are getting harmed by agents of the state following the regulations. So if regulations are reality, I can't just tell the cops busting down my doors, sorry, I'm a free man. So this is the tension that I see constantly. I think, I, I want, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna have people come up, max two minutes, we're gonna cut you at two minutes, and give your case for 
one side or the other, and everybody just kind of understands no one's 100% on, on, on either side. I don't, I don't think, unless you want to make that case, I think that'd be an interesting case to make. Um, be my guest, but does anyone want to kick it off for either, for either side, to make their case on either side? Where's all the ideologues here? <laughs> JD, all right. Mr. Guillotine himself, let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the way I think about this is you have this enormous tree and you're trying to chop it down. You can start by the branches and it's going to take you a very, very long time. And meanwhile, all the other branches keep growing. Or you can cut it at the root and be done with it. And if you're familiar with the, familiar with the analogy that uh, you know, statism is a religion, well, a Larkin Rose approach is basically to say, hey, I'm going to educate people for them to realize they don't have to be, give consent. So once consent is gone, basically the whole thing falls apart. And so, <clears throat> you know, that's sort of my approach. But I totally get the uh, the idea that uh, <clears throat> you know being pragmatic uh, is important for the people that we care about. So anyway, that's it. That was a great the job. Tree analogy. <laughs> <laughs> Who's next? All right, well, let's we either rebut or just continue piling yeah, on. Yeah, rebut, rebut. It doesn't matter. We can any direction. Vetoes. After 74 years, and one of the founding members in Atlanta of the Libertarian Party, I have concluded that the beauty is to be found in the fact that everyone looks, but not everyone sees the same thing. We all listen, but we don't all hear the same things. And in the debate between whether one should be practical or ideal, it's the wrong issue. Because the bottom line is always that we each must strive to see discern, understand, and act in accordance with reality. And if reality is a particularly onerous, political, unjust system, and we're gonna try and do something about it, we have to take it into account. If the reality is not, it's simple, plain, there's no issues, and it's easy to see what one needs to do, such as wrestling with, with the earth, or a harvest or whatever, then there is no ideal, there's just the practical. Focus on it. So the bottom line is, is that you've got to discern reality and act in accordance with it, or you're likely not going to achieve what you wanted to achieve in the first place. Very tautological concern. All right, anybody? All right, here we go. Fire and brimstone. <laughs> Give it to us. She's ready. I want you to yell, yell at the crowd like you yelled at me earlier. Can I yell? No, I'm just kidding. Okay, I'm Susan Kochevar, and I spent a lot of time thinking about pragmatism. Uh, I ran for office three times for state representative. And one of the problems I think I see in politics is that people try to be pragmatic about it. And when you are pragmatic about these issues, you're always negotiating backwards on your rights. And I have an example. I have a friend who's on city council, and they were studying chickens and whether the community should be able to have chickens in their backyard. So he saw the issue as, yes, that's more freedom. These people can have chickens in their backyard. I said, but there's something else to consider. The other side is going to ask to have those chicken coops in your backyard inspected. And this gets people used to having someone in their backyard, and then what they see in your backyard is your chicken coop, and maybe they see another violation. So this gets these people onto your property and searching your home. So although he saw more freedom, it didn't work that way. That's what always happens mm -hmm. when you're pragmatic about it. The other side, has some sort of way to come around it. And we can see that with the CBD issues. So now they're gonna take CBD off the schedule list. 
So what does the FDA say? Ah, now we can regulate it. And we're in far more trouble that way than we were before. No shit. So that's why I think that, um, and for me, it's probably not so much idealism as it is sticking to a set of principles. So I guess I'm idealistic about those principles. And I would tell you to look at a really fascinating lecture by Leonard Peacock um, about acting on principle. And what you do is you, you take all of these different facts, you put them together into a concept, you develop a principle so that you know how to legislate or function in your life. So I probably come down way more on the ideas so I want to build on what she said about running for office. She ran three times a principal campaign and didn't get elected any of those times. And the Libertarian Party, we run a lot of candidates for um, larger offices, governor and uh, representative, et cetera, like that. And they never get elected. So if you're pragmatic, maybe you should run as a Republican. Or maybe you should run for a smaller office. So I ran for water board and got elected. So I can't do much. I'm not writing laws, but I can make a little bit of a difference. So there's a pragmatic way where you can stay true to your values and just work at a smaller scale. Um, the other thing is activism. You can do idealistic activism, like um, several people, some people who attend on a regular basis, have worked to get rid of uh, the grocery tax uh, in various cities. So it's now gone in Littleton and gone in Lakeland. And they're working on Arvada next, I think. But um, you know that's making progress. It's small, so maybe the idea of being pragmatic is work on something small that we can accomplish instead of always jousting at windmills. Okay, so I think you should take freedom wherever you can get it in whatever amount and by whatever means does the least amount of harm to you. Now that can be annoying and I think it does cause us to have to ruin our values a little bit here and there. But, for example, in Colorado, weed is legal, and I think a lot less people are going to jail for that. I think that's a good thing, and I think that outweighs everything else. Yeah, there's problems with it. Uh, there's more taxes. We're funding the state. I mean, in theory, those taxes go to good things. We don't really know uh, how, how good it actually is. But I think you can look at things and see the, the total outcome that the violence of the state is lessened by something like that. So, you know, on the other sense, I kind of hate all these anarchists who won't vote, even though I'm one of them, because I think it's a terrible system and it's not effective, but I support anyone who will vote for freedom in whatever method that comes. Um, the same with anyone who will run for Congress or any particular position and will actually move freedom forward. The problem is that most of them won't. Most of them are sellouts and neither can't. So I don't think it's effective, but I would support anyone who, who would try to do that. This isn't an argument in either way, but let's let's do a reductio ad absurdum. Okay, imagine we're back in slave times. Slavery is totally legal. Everyone's cool with it. We are among the few abolitionists. We start getting our abolitionist movement going, and finally we get some traction. Then a legislator says, you know what? I'm going to listen to these damn abolitionists. They've been making a bunch of noise. I'm sick and tired of them. Here, I'll throw you guys a bone. I want I will run a bill that will say. Slavery is still legal, and slaves still have to be slaves, but their masters can't beat them anymore. Would we vote for that? What, what, what would the position be of the abolitionists? Would they take that? Would they take that small little bit in, in, uh, and then continue going down the path that they're going? Or do they say, We're not, we won't support you, Mr. Legislator. We're not going to support this piece of legislation because it doesn't get rid of this abomination that we're trying to, to kill. So what do you do? I'm going to build on that thought. Basically, from the standpoint of the leftists, they chip away. They chip away at things, right? Little by little. Oh, we'll just do this, right? We're only going to expect one thing in your house. Next thing you know, it's everything in your house. 
works for them can work for us, hence what you're saying, right? If you can get a little bit of the pie, then you work on the next bit, you work on the next bit. Before you know it, you've eaten half of it, and it's gone. And then you got to go to diet. That sucks. <laughs> Don't make resolution. You know? accomplish All right, Mr. Right. I'll totally second that. I mean, it's basically, you know, that whole idea of the tree is that you have this core belief that the state is entitled to rule you. You know, mm -hmm. they need your consent. Once they have your consent, they can start doing things, and that's one branch. And in that branch, you get new branches. You know, because it keeps growing. That's the way it grows. So that's what he's saying. And the idea of, you know, <clears throat> just fighting one of those, it's kind of pointless. Uh, you have to kill the root. And you can kill the root by killing the belief itself, that the fact that it's basically they have the right to rule you, or you can fight it just violently, you know. And when you're a pragmatist, I think you, uh, <clears throat> you sound like Patrick Henry saying, hey, uh, give me liberty or give me a good whipping. You know, it doesn't work, right? That's not what he said. So the radicalism of idealism, I think, is the right answer. Yeah. I'm probably more idealistic, and then to that point, like, does it, do you chip away, but it never goes away? So it's like, you know, you still keep it as horrible, and you might have a chance that it's so bad that people are like, this is sick, this is horrible, you're getting rid of it. So let's say slavery, you're chipping away at it, where it's like, okay, you don't get beatings, or you get free health care, or you just get, like, uh, better housing, but it's like the problem being never free. Like, it's, it's easier to keep that injustice keep going because it's just like you make it a little easier to live with. It's like, oh, they're getting housing. They're even getting a little bit of pay. They're getting vacations. You know, that it's like, but, they, you know, they're still forced to be there. Like, but then it's like all this chipping away makes it a little easier to live with. So I think that's a little bit of the argument against that. Like, again, I'm probably, again, maybe I would like vote for that stuff, but it's like, like, again... You know, if we're arguing like, oh, pragmatic for like making the tax code better, or like things like that, instead of the injustice that it is theft, where it's like you just make it easier, like if you keep on making it easier, does it ever go away that you just kind of live with? So I, that's where I could see a little bit of the problem. So, anywho. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can't just be a Hey guys, I'm Jake. Um, so, just to add on to your point, really, um, I don't know the story, but didn't we just kind of chop away at slavery, like bit by bit? Like, I love the analogy, but didn't, I mean, isn't it sort of a misconception that the Civil War was just over slavery entirely? Like, you know, for a bunch of economic reasons and other stuff like that. You know, we look at things like child labor. Like, wasn't it just kind of uh, fading out? Uh, you know, we're at 2% or something when they make the law. And so, um, maybe I'm a, like, ideologue disguised as a pragmatist, you know? But like, but so, so, so don't we need to convince the masses in order to do something like what you're suggesting? And then, I don't know, just if we look at history, does it, does it, uh, does it usually work that way? Do we usually chop the tree down? Like, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that's it, that's it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would just argue that the strongest tree is the tree that bends in the wind. If you're too rigid, you'll break and you'll die. So essentially, this is a Darwinistic issue. And libertarians are already endangered. I don't want to see them go extinct. <laughs> Because Tom made Tom, I, or you, you in conjunction with Jay, Tom and Jay, um, I think this is how it works. I think ideologues spread the message, the masses eventually, you eventually get the numbers of, of people 
to make it politically palatable to do something. And then the pragmatists do it. So you needed the abolitionists to make the case, and then eventually a bunch, a bunch more people start believing that, oh, this is obviously the case. And then after the masses, after some number, 51% gets reached in polling, the pragmatists then make it happen. So nothing political happens that's not politically popular, at least among a large swath of the people. So maybe the idealists convince the people and the pragmatists do it. Is that true or not? I don't know. Just a thought ahead, because I really liked what Jay and, and, and Tom had to say. Pat? Yep, yep. So my, my creds are going back about 55 years where I got to be involved in most of those movements in the late 60s and early 70s and got to see up front what things happen. And I studied with a man named C. George Bonello, who was a radical sociologist, and he was a friend of Saul Alinsky, and so I was taught how to be a community organizer. But in the classes that George taught, he had a lot of caveats, and one of the things he talked about was the fact that in the last years of Alinsky's life, he was dying of cancer in his apartment in Chicago, and groups would come to him and ask him to help organize against you know, bad landlords, bad businesses, whatever. Except, Olinsky would say, I was in your neighborhood 15 years ago. I was in your neighborhood 20 years ago. What happened? Well, guess what? The people who were there trying to make the changes were now the bullies. Yeah. And I've seen this in my work in conflict management over and over again, where you have a, uh, somebody who's really against something, and they're good-hearted, and what they're against is a bad thing. And I know it's really hard for libertarians to think that we're like humans, like everyone else, and subjected to the same flaws. But, you know, what can I say? I married one. You know, so it's like not perfect. And I think we have to be humble and afraid that some of our big radical ideas will have horrifying unintended consequences that will make, me, make us all ashamed of ourselves. So that's something that I think we should be very alert to. There's a book on this written by Doris Lessing called Prisons We Choose to Live Inside. It's four short essays, and it's been in print for a number of years. Prisons We Choose to Live Inside by Doris Lessing. And she warns about how even good people can be caught up in ideologies that justify them doing things that eventually hurt lots and lots of people. So that's what I think about almost every day. There's lots of revolutionaries that are like that. Oh yeah, and then we have to go shoot the revolutionaries. Like the rest of them. Break the rules. Get on the list. Okay, stop. What? And you're not married to him, right? I bought all of them around. Right. Well, oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah, to continue that thought, like think of all these revolutionaries that, like, they kind of get in thought of doing a good thing. You know, like Gaddafi was considered this like liberator and stuff. I, I forget who he. Uh, defeated, but like I mean, like even Hitler, like it's just like oh, you know, here I'm coming in to fix this system, you know that again, uh, you know, Justin was saying this earlier that a lot of these ideologues, like you just kind of live in the clouds. You have this like theory, you don't know if it's gonna you know work or not. But you, you think, I mean, I guess it's somewhere we're kind of getting to where, I mean, so much of this plan so far have been these authoritarians, and it's like you know. If, even ten percent of the population doesn't agree with it. You got to get rid of them, you know. Like, you know, like that's the kind of thing where like kind of people talk about like, oh, oh, I hate this certain population or whatever. I want to get rid of them. And it's like, well, kind of think that out. What get rid of them means, you know, that like even like um, oh, I'm kind of rambling a little bit. Like I was talking to some communists, and it's like, would you be okay if you could live in your communist thing while other people could live in their other, you know, like other ideas? Most of them said okay, but like a lot of people across the political spectrum, things that just won't work. But but again, like that's what the problem is. Like if you get in charge, like libertarians win. Like if we have problems with the communists, do we need to get rid of them? Like you know, it's like you know, it's like that's kind of I I, I kind of going a little bit. Um, I I I think I'm more of an ideologue. Like I just dream of these beautiful cities of uh, statelessness that are just like filled with glass and pretty and, and uh, have blimps and rocket packs. <laughs> and it's just there, like it's just like panacea, you know? And, uh, but I do kind of wonder, like if people just like can't do well in that system, do they get fired from society? Do they, do we just have gates 
and just like it's like here you go into the wilderness. You know, you're not gonna stay here or whatever. We're firing. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. You know, so I I do kind of wonder about that. And like sometimes I wonder too, like in that society where um would people, you know, like again, we believe in property rights. Do people like overreact? Like, d does a neighbor throw his trash on his, like his neighbor's lawn, and then the neighbor just gets mad and shoots him? Like, it's like, oh, I'm just going to take care of this. I'm going to get rid of them. You know, like there, where, you know, I wonder if that's a problem. So, like, yeah, like, uh, I do, you know, it's again this ideal city with blimps and rocket packs. Like, I don't know if that's right for everybody, but uh, I'm so sorry. Anyway, that, that's what I just kind of wonder uh, that, uh, yeah, it's. Whoever gets in charge, do, what do you do handle with uh, the other, like, when you get, like, the title, quote, unquote, get rid of them. So, I yield my time. <laughs> I think I want to endorse what Justin said. The vision. Oh, my God. <laughs> the, vision, <laughs> the vision must always precede and will always precede the violence. And that's because ideas matter, and they matter more than guns. And history is full of this. Now, once the violence breaks out, then, of course, guns do matter. I would point out that before slavery was ended, and the whole society upon which slavery was built was ended for good, it took the utter destruction of the South to make that happen. The same thing is true with World War II. There was no way the same thing that happened at the end of World War I was going to happen again at the end of World War II. We had learned the total defeat of Germany and Japan was essential before we could begin anew. The Treaty of Versailles that ended World War I gives an example of what happens when you when, you, when the idea is not challenged and refuted. It festers and reappears in a different form. So I would just summarize by endorsing what you said, Justin, that, that it's the vision before the violence that will ultimately predominate and give rise to whatever violence is necessary to establish the vision. I want to primarily just challenge an assumption and then a statement um, in that last one. So one is the assumption that violence is necessary. Violence is not necessary. <laughs> and two, violence was not necessary to eliminate slavery in the United States. It did not require slavery. Uh, the elimination of slavery did not require a civil war in so many other countries. And to think that in order to enact change, that violence is necessary or okay, frankly, that the violence that uh, <coughs> the violence is needed to make a huge change is something that I, I hope is not a predominant belief in this room because I'm here all sad. Um, I'm I'm here and I'm in this room because I'm a nonviolent person because I do not intend to aggress on other people. My foundation is in the now. And I hope that that's true of a lot of people here. Sorry. But um, yeah, I think she's totally right. Um, the idea of cutting down this tree is because it's a belief. The belief that people, ha other people have the right to rule. Slavery ended in Haiti. Um, the French were forced to agree to end slavery because there were some uprising in Haiti. And, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, but one thing that's not very well known is that <clears throat> first, um, in Haiti, the uh, big whites, the small whites, the colored, and the blacks, they, they tried to actually convince the blacks that, that to make, basically make them vote. That example you gave, of having a better treatment, they tried that. And they agreed, but it didn't stop them. What didn't stop them? The realization that they were equal. 
that's the thing. Is the, the idea propels itself. So <clears throat> I'll go back to this. The tree is a tree of tragedies of the commons. Once you establish the idea that people can rule you, it's an open game. It, it would be false to think that uh, <clears throat> every incremental uh, power that the state gets is just that. No, there's all kinds of incentives. Now all kinds of uh, <clears throat> administrations, people that are, whose livelihood depends on this. So the incentives are there to per perpetuate this whole system. So <clears throat> if you just try to eliminate one branch or another, all you're doing is just cutting a little bit of a, you know, snipping a little bit of a branch. What's really important is to stop the belief that people can rule you. Once you take that away, it's like ending slavery. I don't necessarily want to rebut that, but I might. Uh, I remember I was talking to my boss, John Caldera, and I was making an argument against school vouchers. And I was saying, if we allow vouchers, um, vouchers for kids to go to private schools, then the government now has their tentacles in all the private schools. I was making this very you know, tree cutting down the whole damn thing argument with John, and he said, well, what about the families who, who have kids that are suffering right now? And I never really thought about that profound statement. I never, I was like thinking in the clouds of like what would be the best situation for everybody down the road. And I didn't stop to consider like the, the libertarian in the back with the medical marijuana woman of what's happening to people right now. So again, I still think that this is a tension between reality and what we want. And so a lot of kids are suffering in awful, awful, awful public schools right now. Awful. And not necessarily in this state because we have open enrollment, you can go anywhere you want. But the idea that I would stop somebody from having a voucher to a private school, to, stop somebody from having a voucher to a, to a situation that's better for them right now when they've been suffering, I think I would be wrong to stop that betterment from happening. Because I want the whole shebang. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I wouldn't be wrong. But I still think that we, uh, us with our heads in the clouds have to deal with the fact that reality is the way that it is and there are people suffering right now. People are getting their doors kicked down and there are kids suffering in shitty schools. And if there's a, some way that we can help somebody's situation right now, I think we'd be wrong not to do it. Just to build on exactly what you were getting at in detail, if people see that vouchers are working and that the lives of the children and the families are improved, then you can work at the base of the tree. Right? If you go straight to the base of the tree, it's the old saying, who's gonna, you're just gonna be labeled an ideologue and people are gonna ignore you. You have to show progress. When you show progress, people start to buy in, then you can stop chopping more branches on and go for the base. But vouchers is a good start, like you were saying. You can show the progress. My kids take advantage of the fact that you're portable to the schools in the state. I pay an extra amount for them to go to a different school than they would go if they were living where I live. And it's a start. So, uh, it's called the, 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 the move for the, um, what do you call it, movement or building? Your feet. The building exactly. theory. Get the ball rolling in the right ball. direction. <laughs> snowball theory. Oh, okay. exactly. You got to yeah. the snowballs yeah. in the right oh, this direction. Is nice. This is nice. Let's keep going. This, yeah. is, yeah. um, this obviously doesn't apply to any of us, but do we still? <laughs> do people still use the phrase um, armchair Marxists? <laughs> because I remember sitting in a room in 1969 with a group of people from the SDS, and um, they were talking about the importance of ending the war in Vietnam. And their scheme was to blow up all the bridges going in and out of Manhattan, which would cause the death of hundreds of thousands of people eventually because of loss of everything. And they thought that was a good idea. They were all middle and upper middle class kids. 
right? Who would then go back to their families in Boston or whatever and feel really good and, um, about themselves. Uh, my husband and I ran into the same kind of thinking along with in South Africa having to do with apartheid, but the um, various methods people had to fight apartheid, some of which hurt everybody in South Africa. And when confronted, we would have friends who say, well, we must we reap what the wind sows. And I said, so you're this rich guy and you're funding um, uh, the uh, boycott against South Africa, even though you know for sure people are dying as a result, he said, well, that's just the collateral damage that's necessary. And this was a very left-wing progressive liberal who said, we have to fight apartheid by killing people. That was basically the bottom line. So again, let's be humble. <laughs> let's watch out, okay? Let's, and, and things aren't binary. It is an either or. Okay. <laughs> All right, so um, I agree that ideas are unequal. There's, you know, uh, you know, we, we, we should battle out ideas, you know, and that's not in the arena of diversity and equality and all that, you know. Um, anyway, I, I don't know if any of you guys listen to Jason Stapleton, uh, that podcast, but they're, uh, they're revamping their show into less of a libertarian podcast and more into a motivation, self-help kind of thing, but they've been talking a lot about, you know, libertarianism in action, and, you know, the people that actually have the business that helps the people at the lower cost for the better service, you know, and then that's how we show them. We actually like, do that, and it's less about voting and about, you know, the theory and, you know, the ideas, and then basically I just want to get back to the chopping the tree of the root idea. It's, it's really like, it's a, it's a nice idea, but how? You know, how, how, how do we do that in action? And then how do, you know, if, if the whole concept of this podcast is like, go, but show people, show people that you're, that you're the doctor that's doing this, you're the lawyer that's doing this, you know? Um, I don't know, I guess I'm just posing questions, really. But, <laughs> you know, like, like, like I want to be an ideologue, basically. But just, like, how is, is, is the best way to make progress through cutting down the branches, really? Yeah. <laughs> We're going to do two or three more. Anyone else want to come up? Anyone who hasn't spoken yet? I've had this argument with libertarians before, and I think it has to do with timing. A little over 100 years ago, we had a world without borders. There was no such thing as passports prior to World War I, the end of World War I. You could traverse, you know, the, the, the stories about the, you know, the, the, the wandering people and on safari would go from country to country to country to country. There's no such thing as, you know, as passports back then. There was also no such thing as a welfare state, right? So, you know, one thing is that, is, is empire that sticky that we're so afraid of it that we can't wait it out? That's like, wait, I'm not saying wait. I'm saying, but we can wait it out. Empires have always fallen. And the order of, of our accomplishments, both from the ideological viewpoint, is that we want this, and we achieve it this by this by this, gets to us to the end, but it, there's, there's, a time, there's, a time, there's a time arc to it. So those of us who are a little older have gone from a world in which the, world, the word libertarian meant libraries. <laughs> yeah. Two, it's now on even on MSNBC. So you see the arc of change happen. It's hard to see it in a day, or in a year, or an election period. And and so I think the the, the, the difference between the pragmatist and, and the ideologue in this room is just a matter of timing and a matter of scale. The pragmatist sees the steps, and the ideologue sees the goal. And all the arguments about achieving the goal in sequence of order are the, are the, the strategy that needs to be worked out between the two groups. What are the steps while the ideas are there? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
My name is Leif, and I, I seem to have uh, an uncommon curse or gift, and it's my inability to understand things that everybody else seems to understand. I don't understand why this is a problem at all, and I'm just inviting any of you if you see me in a place where you can explain it to me, please do. Thank you. Hey, do you want to go again? I, I was waiting for you to explain a little more about what, Last one. what you told me earlier. You want to, you want to explain what you told me earlier? <laughs> do you want to go? I think what this young man was trying to say is one side needs the other. That's just the reality of the situation. If you don't have people who think through the strategy step by step how you get something done within a company, right, it doesn't get done. A CEO usually comes up with a vision. Here's my big, very audacious goal. Then he goes to his VPs and goes, how do we get there? within your different organizations, and they lay out a plan, well, that's your ideal life, and that's your pneumatic people. You can't have one without the other. They need each other. Wait, can I, can I just... <laughs> um, I love your I love your comment, Leif, because what what is the problem between these two poles? And here's the problem that I think I see, and I see it play out in this room and everywhere else in the 15, no, Jesus Christ, 20 years I've been in this horrendous movement, um, is that the, the, pro the problem is, at, at its core, I think a dismissal problem, where one side gets to dismiss the other side. Oh, you're just pie in the sky, blah, 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 and then they, they shut down their ears. Oh, you're just this statist idiot that believes that government owns them, blah, and then they, sh then they shut their ears. So I think these two poles are, are bickering and fighting and shutting themselves off to each other, and they don't work together like they have to work together, because... Again, I think this is yin and yang. I think you need one without the other. You, if if all we are all we are pragmatists, where are we going? And if, if we're always up here, then there are people suffering in, in reality. So they they ab they absolutely obviously need each other. But I think the problem is they fight and they bicker and then they shut themselves off because you're that thing and then oh no you're that thing you're an idiot no you're an idiot that's generally how it goes. I'm the idiot. <laughs> I think what Justin said was a very good response to what I said. And my question now is what is the magic emulsifier that will dissolve the disagreement and bring everybody together, drawing the best that each has to offer and integrating it? Two more. Wayne, Ben, that's it. That's it. I consider myself an idealist, but I see the, the use of both sides. And the way I see my function here uh, as an idealist is to push the edge of the Overton window. And that allows the pragmatist to work within the window but farther in that direction. Yeah. 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 I just wanted to, that is me. Wow. <laughs> it's been a little bit, you but I'm mad. Good. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to add on, like the last, what the last couple people have been saying is, is great, is amazing. That's where everything happens, right? You have to have the far one side to push things because honestly, if I am somebody over here just thinking about all the well-being of people, I will never think past the things that hurt a few people to get something done. And it's not about, it's not so much about whether this side, like he said, you know, one, one side oversteams the other. For me, I want to, in everything I do, and it's not just this discussion, it's all these discussions with right versus left, right? Where you want to be the person, for me, the person in the middle that's actually getting stuff done, and you need both parties, you know, somebody on the far right to think past, well, you know, this is gonna hurt a lot of people, but if we do it, then what can be done? And then they think to the next step that might remove the part that hurts all the people, but if you never get there, 
because you're so focused and oh, I'm gonna hurt 10 people, then that's that's all the problem. And then on the other side, you have to have, bring them, you know, have that balance back in. So <clears throat> for me, the, the whole argument is not who's right and wrong, but just that we have that debate, right? That debate is everything. That That's what this whole group is about. It's not about, okay, some people who think this way about government are wrong, and some people who think this way are about government are wrong. That's never been, as far as what I remember, what this you know, this community has been about. The community you changed. No. Uh, <laughs> the community is, you know what? You're wrong. It's been about open it's been about open argument and debate and how what we can learn and discover through those debates between these, you know, very opposite sides, right? So uh, I agree, it's it's one hundred percent, you know, the debate needs to happen. The debate is important, but what's actually decided is irrelevant because as long as that debate's happening, somebody's gonna go out there and affect change. So. All right, that's our conversation. Thanks everyone for coming out. Now that we're all pragmatic idealists, we hope to see you back two weeks from now. Mark Solomon will be speaking on his infinite baking concept. Uh, so again, we'll be back in two weeks, and I hope to see everyone there. Have a great night, and keep fighting the state.